Welcome to the Canadian edition of The Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. Andrew, I'm very thankful to learn from you, to have learned from you, and to continue to learn from you. I just appreciate your boldness in the truth. Don't stop it. And I don't think you will. <laughs> and now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Monday's broadcast of The Gospel Truth. Today I'm beginning a series teaching on one of my favorite things to talk about, and that is how to find, how to follow, and how to fulfill God's will. This used to be three separate teachings, one on how to find God's will, one on how to follow, and one how to feel, fulfill, and I've combined them all into one book, and this is a 290-page uh, book. We have a little brief summary of it here, about 50 pages. It just summarizes it. This is a freebie. This, we are asking for a donation on this. We don't deny people access to it if you don't send a donation, but we really do ask for a donation. And then we've got study guides on how to find God's will, another study guide on how to follow, and then another one on how to fulfill. We've also got TV programs uh, that are on USB as well as DVD, and then we have DVDs from a live teaching. So I've got a lot of material on this. This is one of the very first things that the Lord used in my life. Uh, when I was a little kid, I knew that God had a purpose for me. I don't know how I knew that, but I just knew. I don't know if I was told these things or if it, if it was intuitive. You know, the scripture says in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 20, that God has revealed Himself against all of our unrighteousness and unworthiness so that there is an intuitive knowledge on the inside of us of God's existence. And uh, so I don't know if it was just this knowledge that every one of us had when we were uh, young or whether it was something that was taught to me, but I remember as a young kid, like five or six years old, just laying out in the backyard at night and looking up at the stars and trying to comprehend how big this universe was and then trying to figure out what's my place in it. And I remember doing this so often that my mother got worried about me. My mother actually started asking, what are you doing out there? And, you know, I didn't know how to explain what I was doing. I just knew that there was a God and I was trying to figure out what's my place in all of this. And so I've had, I've had this knowledge on the inside of me uh, since as early as I can remember that God had a purpose for my life. But you know, when I was real little, I just got caught up in everything. When I started school, uh, I, I just was like everybody else. I had my life planned out all the way up through high school, so I wasn't real serious about it until I got ready to graduate from high school and we were having to make plans about what I was gonna do when I went to college. You had to declare a major and, and in a sense start planning out the rest of your life. So when I was a senior in high school and I could see this graduation coming, I got serious. And I mean, I started asking questions about how do you know what God's will for your life is? And I asked the Baptist pastor and I asked a lot of people that I knew who I figured should know these things. And basically they didn't have an answer. Uh, it was kind of like, you know, most people say about how do you know the person you're supposed to marry? And they just come up with all these weird things like you'll see stars or hear bells or, you know, it's just some, something like you know. And that wasn't sufficient for me. And so what I did my senior year in high school, I started reading the Bible every single night. I would uh, come home, you know, from being with my friends or whatever at eight or nine o'clock, and I would read until one or two in the morning. I read through the entire Bible my senior year in high school as well as I bought this Matthew Henry five volumes of commentary. And I mean, they were thick. Each volume was like that. And I read through most of that. And I was just pouring through the Word of God trying to figure out how do you know what God wants you to do with your life? And so this was one of the very first things that grabbed my attention, and that is what God used. When I was reading in Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And that last phrase about the perfect will of God just jumped out at me, 
And it was like a neon sign, you know, pointing to here. This is how you know God's will for your life. You do these things and you will prove. The word prove means to make manifest to the physical senses what is the good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God. And so those scriptures are the first scriptures that ever just really revolutionized my life. And I mean from uh, Christmas of 1967 until March the 23rd, 1968, about all I did was read Romans 12, 1 and 2 and ask what it meant to be a living sacrifice, what it meant to not be conformed to this world. How do you transform yourself through the renewing of your mind? And I was just praying and looking up scriptures and trying to figure these things out. And then I had this miraculous encounter with the Lord on March the 23rd, 1968. And I mean, it forever changed my life. And I often just start with that experience and talk from there. But actually, you know, what led me into that was that I knew God had a purpose for my life and I was seeking to know what it was. So trying to understand God's will for my life is really what drew me into relationship with the Lord. And I firmly believe that if I had not have been seeking this, that I could have done my own thing. You would have never seen me on television. I don't know what I'd have done, but I guarantee you my life wouldn't have gone the direction that it's gone. Uh, when I got to seeking the Lord, the Lord revealed things to me that just revolutionized and changed the entire course of my life. And I'm convinced that the average person, the average Christian, does not know for certain what God wants them to do. They're just going through life, kind of like a pinball. You just, you know, pull back this lever and you launch this ball and it just bounces off of things and, and it just depends on, on what happens. And this is how most people live their life. They let the, you know, they're like water and they just go with the path of least resistance. They go to the lowest level. And that's the way that most Christians live their life. I'm not saying that to criticize anybody, but I am saying that that is far, far below what God intended for each one of us. We did not evolve. We did not just come on this earth by accident. God created us and He created us with a very specific purpose. And some of you watching this might think, well, that's for you. You know, a minister, somebody like that, God has a purpose for your life. But everybody else, you just do the best you can and pray that it honors God and you just go through life and que sera, sera, whatever will be. That's not what the Word of God teaches. Let me turn over to Psalms chapter 139 and share these verses with you. And I wish I had time to read this whole chapter because it's powerful. Just talking about the way that God is intimately involved in every single person's life. It says that there's not even a thought in our head that God knows it completely. And then it says, where can I go to escape from him? I can't go up into heaven. If I go down into hell, he's there with me. I, I can't get away from God because he has possessed my reins. You know, the Bible used reins the way that we use the heart. Not talking about the pump, but just your inner thoughts, your inner person. God has possessed us. And, and then let me just read this in uh, Psalms 139, verse 13. For thou hast possessed my reins. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. You know, I'm reading from the King James, and this is just really wordy. Let me read this out of the NIV. If you were to go in and study this, all of this is in the King James, but here's just this said in a modern language. In verse 16, it says, Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Man, that is powerful. This is saying that before we were even born, when we were in our mother's womb, God had a plan for us. We did not happen. It doesn't matter how you were conceived. You know, some people talk about, uh, you know, uh, being against abortion except in the case of rape or incest or something like that. 
And again, I understand that having a situation where a person has been raped or had incest, that that's a terrible thing. And it would be terrible for a young girl to have to give birth and in a situation like that. But look at it this way. The child that is conceived didn't do anything wrong. It doesn't matter how they were conceived. The child should not be punished for what somebody else did. And uh, abortion is murder. Look at this verse right here in verse 16. It says, Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. Did you know that the phrase substance, yet being unperfect, is translated from the Hebrew word golem? And here's what it means. It means a wrapped and unformed mass, that is, the embryo. This is talking about when you were just an embryo, the moment that you were conceived from that moment on, it says that God saw you and, according to this modern translation, the NIV, it says every day of your life was written in His book. If you go to, I think it's the New Living Translation, uh, I forget the exact wording, but it says that God had every day of your life scheduled. Did you know that it's not up to you to just do your own thing and ask God to bless it? Now, there's a lot of people that don't even consider God and they don't seek God, and they're just doing whatever they want to do, whether good, bad, or indifferent. Uh, that ought to be obvious that that is not the way that God wants you to live. But even as a Christian, most Christians believe that maybe people like me, who's a minister, that God's got a specific plan for your life, or somebody that God's going to use in some way that influences millions of people, that maybe, you know, there are certain people that God has selected, but the average Christian does not understand what this is saying, that every day of your life was scheduled when you were still in the embryonic stage. God had written in a book everything that He wanted your life to be. Now, this does not mean that everything that's happened to you was written by God because God gave you total freedom of choice. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19 says, Behold, I call heaven and earth to record against you this day that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that you and your seed may live. God gave you a choice. You are not a robot. He is not going to force you to follow what His plan for your life is. You are autonomous, and you can choose to go any way you want to go. Boy, that needs to be explained. I'm not going to take time to go in. I could spend a week on that, but there are some religious people that believe that God is sovereign in the sense that He just controls you like a puppet, and so they say that whatever happens, it's God's will. If you've got a cancer, God must have put it on you to teach you something, or He's punishing you or doing something like that. I disagree with that 1,000 percent. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says that, you know, he was talking about some people who were mocking and saying, you've been saying that Jesus is coming for years and nothing ever changes. And it says, this they willingly are ignorant of, that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. And then it goes on to say that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And he, that it's saying that to show you that that's the reason He delays His coming is because He wants people to receive and He doesn't want to just bring this to an end and send all of those people that have rejected Him to hell. So that's the reason that He delays His coming is because He longs to see more people brought into the kingdom. But in the process of saying that, it makes it very clear that it's not God's will that a single person should perish, and yet they are. That shows you right there that God's will does not just automatically come to pass. It says God is not willing that any should perish. That is not God's will, and yet things that are not God's will happen. So God does not force you to follow His plan. But man, think about this. This applies to everyone. It doesn't matter if you're in ministry. It doesn't matter if you know what color you are, what gender you are. Nothing can change this. Every one of us, while we were still an embryo, I mean, from the moment of conception, God possessed our reins. And God has written in a book what your life is supposed to be. Man, that's awesome. You are not just free 
Well, let me rephrase that. You are free to choose whatever you want, but the right choice is to follow God's leading. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 23 says, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walks to direct his steps. You know what that is saying is that God has given us the freedom and you can choose to do anything you want to do. He won't force you, but you aren't smart enough to run your own life. You're, you've given, been given the freedom, but the right choice would be to run up a white flag and to say, oh God, I, you know, it is not in man that walks to direct his own steps. I need your leadership. Boy, there's so many scriptures I could quote about. There is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Proverbs 3, 5, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. In all of your ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct your paths. And on and on and on and on we could go. I mean, the Bible just is constantly saying that, yes, you're free to run your life, but someday we're going to stand before God and we will give an answer for what we have done, whether it was good or bad. And you know, there's a passage of Scripture over in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm not going to take time to read it, just to save some time. But it talks about that there is a foundation laid. That's Jesus. The only way that you can have a relationship with God is through faith in Jesus. And so Paul said, I have laid this foundation, but other people are building on this foundation and they better take heed how they build because if they build gold, silver, and precious stones, those things will last. But if you build on this foundation, and he's talking about the foundation of Jesus, this isn't talking about you losing your salvation. You could be born again, and yet if you are building upon that foundation your own thing, doing your own will, that's like wood, hay, and stubble. And when we stand before God, God is going to set a match to our works. And if it's these metals, these gold, silver, and precious stones, those will last the fire. They will be purified by the fire, and we will get a reward. This isn't talking about your salvation. But if you have done your own thing, and it doesn't matter if you've got trophies sitting on your mantle. It doesn't matter if people gave you a claim. Maybe you attained great things in your own strength and in your own power, but is that what God had written in His book for you? I know that this is a radical statement. There are people right now that have, you've been very pleased with your life and, it, and you're proud. And man, you've just done all of these things. And as I'm saying this, it causes uneasiness in you like, is it possible that I have just done my own thing, that I've been dependent upon my own self and I haven't done what God called me to do? Am I going to be held accountable for that? It says that God is going to try every man's work of what sort it is. That's over in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. But it didn't say what size it is. It's what sort it is. Did you know God didn't call everybody to be on television the way I am? Or God didn't call everybody to be a senator or a House of Representatives. God didn't call everybody to be in some leadership position. You know, what did God call you to do? You are going to be held accountable to that plan that was written in His book before you were ever born. And it doesn't matter if people gave you a claim and if in the eyes of the world you've done great. Like there, there are rock musicians that are as ungodly as they can. And I'm not saying this about every single one, but I, you understand what I'm saying, that a lot of rock musicians die of drug overdoses. They live in sexual immorality. And in the world standards, they just talk about them. They may be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. You might be in the Baseball Hall of Fame, the Football Hall of Fame. You may have all of these things to your credit, but did you do what God ordained you to do? And if you didn't, it's going to be wood, hay, and stubble. And when God puts the match to it, it's going to be reduced to a pile of ashes. It goes on to say that they themselves will be saved, yet so as by fire. If you are truly born again, your foundation will withstand this fire that's going to try every man's work of what sort it is. But if you have just done your own thing, regardless of how successful you are, if you have done your own thing instead of what God called you to do, you are, all of your great works and all of your trophies and your awards are going to be reduced to a pile of ashes. I don't believe that there's a bad way to get into heaven. 
If you are truly born again, your foundation is sure, you're going to get into heaven, and as it says, you'll be saved, yet so as by fire. And so, praise God, heaven's going to be awesome. But man, I don't want to stand before God and find out that He wanted me to do this and I did that. I tell you, that's terrible. And I know that there are millions of people watching this program right now that as you're, if you're listening and if you are actually analyzing your life, am I doing what God called me to do? There are millions of people watching this right now that you aren't sure. And if you're truly born again, if you love God, you may be saying, I hope I am. But you know what? Why do you have to hope? It says over in Ephesians chapter 5, it says, don't be ignorant, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Boy, I just love the Bible, the way it says things. It just cuts to the chase. Don't be ignorant. Did you know if you don't know that what you're doing is what God called you to do, you're burning daylight. This isn't a dress rehearsal. You don't get another chance at this. Every day we are moving closer to eternity and you are either taking steps towards what God called you to do or even if you are doing nothing and you're just occupying, if you're just treading water, you're moving in reverse. You're moving away. God never intended for anybody just to occupy space. God's got a purpose for every single person watching this. I don't care what country you live in, what gender you are. It doesn't matter what color you are. It doesn't matter your education level. It doesn't matter your physical height, stature. God knows everything about you. And God has a very specific plan for your life. Not just general, just about you being a good person. No, he has every day's what it says written in his book. And someday those books are going to be opened and God's going to judge us based on what's written in those books. Again, this isn't talking about judgment for the purpose of whether you get into heaven or not. If you have made Jesus your Lord, you're in heaven. You, you've got it made and that counts. But you are going to be judged about what you did with the talents, with the things that he gave you. Did you use them for what he intended. And if you haven't, you, you, your salvation's not at risk, but all of your reward's at risk. I believe that there's going to be people that stand before God, and we're going to see what God's plan for our life was. And I guarantee you, it's going to be infinitely, infinitely better than your plans for yourself. And there would have been rewards stacked up, people's lives that would be changed. Maybe the entire world could have been affected by something that you invented or something that you did, and yet you just chose to do your own thing, and you missed out on all this. Not only did you miss out on it, but everybody else that was intended to be affected by what you've been called to do missed out. And I tell you, I believe there's going to be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, and that's one way, one reason God's going to wipe tears away from our eyes. Not just because we limp into heaven and we've suffered so much in this earth. I think when we stand before the Lord and see what God intended for us to be and do, there's going to be some weeping, and God's going to have to wipe tears away from our eyes. I don't want to do that. I want to be like Paul and say, I ran the race. I finished my course, and I've won. And that's what I'm going for, and that's what I'm encouraging you to do. Let me remind you again that I have this book entitled How to Find, Follow, and Fulfill God's Will. This is a 290-page book that we're asking for a donation of some amount. We're giving away this little booklet that is a brief summary of some of these things. And then we have CDs, DVDs that were taken from television, also taken from a live meeting where I was teaching this. And then we also have study guides. we got a lot of things. So listen to our announcer and please call or write today. Andrew is offering his new booklet, How to Find, Follow, and Fulfill God's Will, as his free gift to you today. This offer is limited to one free booklet per household and is available in the U.S., U.K., Canada, and Australia. Contact us today to receive your free booklet. Andrew's complete series, How to Find, Follow, and Fulfill God's Will, is available as a book and as a newly released CD album, TV DVD album, or as a USB made from our daily television broadcast. This teaching is also available as three comprehensive study guides. The full series is available as three individual teachings, how to find, 
how to follow, and how to fulfill God's will. These teachings are available as DVD albums or as a complete USB recorded live from a ministry event. Each of these valuable resources are available for a gift of any amount when you contact us. Go to our website at awmc.ca to see all the ways you can get these products. You can call the Andrew Womack Ministries Canada Helpline Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Time at 647-348-2220 to order. We shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Listen carefully to my words, for they bring life to those who find them. Learn how you can experience the word operating in your life. You know, we've got Christmas coming up, and the best Christmas present that I think you could give anybody would be this living commentary. It's a digital commentary that you could get on your phone as well as on your laptop, but it is my commentary on over 27,000 verses in the Bible, and we've got special deals that go along with this, some add-ons that go with it, and it would just be a tremendous Christmas present. So listen to our announcer as he gives you some details and please take advantage of this today. Now through December 31st, you can get Andrew's Living Commentary for 50% off. Surprise your loved ones with the enduring joy of the word by going to awmc.ca to get the Living Commentary today. Don't delay, the offer ends on December 31st. I'd like to let all of you, our Canadian viewers, know that we have a Bible college in Toronto, and we would love to have you come and be a part of it. There's multiple ways you can take advantage, not only through the campus there in Toronto, but we have online courses, we have correspondence courses, uh, just a number of ways, but we want to help you, and we're making it as available to you as we possibly can. So check it out with the information's on your screen, our Caris Bible College, Toronto. If Andrew's teachings are making a difference in your life, consider becoming a Grace Partner with Andrew Womack Ministries Canada today. Grace Partners are special friends of the ministry who commit to giving $30 or more per month to help Andrew reach thousands of people here in Canada and around the world with the life-changing message of God's unconditional love and grace. If you'd like to become a Grace Partner today, go to awmc.ca or call our helpline Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Time at 647-348-2220. Also, to learn more about the vision and mission of Andrew Womack Ministries Canada, be sure to visit our website at awmc.ca. While there, you'll also find details about all of the products available and be able to access many of Andrew's teachings absolutely free. Remember, that's awmc.ca.